so, Father, I thank you. You let the meditation, the words of my mouth, and the meditation, that which I have thought on, that which I think on, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable, be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, Yah Yahweh, Jehovah, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. So we're going to look at Isaiah. And if you notice, I did not write out Isaiah 9, 6 on your sheet because that's one scripture that I'm believing that you will learn from memory. And so Isaiah 9, 6 says what? Unto, unto us a what? is born. Unto us a child is born. So in order for Jesus to enter into this earth realm legally, he had to come through the body of a woman, a woman with a womb. So unto us a child is born. And then it says, unto us a son is given. And so the son that's given, he's called the son of God. He's the second person of the Godhead. So that is the deity side of Jesus. He's called the God man. So God meaning deity and man meaning man made flesh. The incarnate, not reincarnation, but incarnate. And so he says unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on his what? And he shall be called what? Wonderful. Mighty. And the peace and the prince of who? He's the prince of shalom. He's the prince of peace. So each time we come together, you're going to quote that. And so by the time I finish teaching, when I do get the opportunity to teach, Pastor will be returning next week. But when I do get the opportunity to teach, we will quote this so that you will know it. All right, so then we're going to read together in unison the second foundational text found in 1 Timothy 3.16. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let's read it together in unison. And it's on your sheet. The sheet that's dated 526 15, part 8. Everybody didn't have it? Yes. Who has it? Everybody has it. Okay, so what does unison mean? Yes. Right. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Let's start. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And so he says, without controversy, and we talked about last week what this word controversy meant. We said this word controversy, when we think about this word, we think about that which is argumentative, that which is debatable, that which brings conflict. And we know that just the word Christian now is very conflictual, isn't it? Uh, are you aware of that? Are you know that being a Christian today is... Not that good. Did you know that? It's good for us. Not for them. Not, it's not that good in terms of the people that's attacking. Okay? But guess what? We win, don't we? Because God hasn't given us what? The spirit of fear, but of power and of love. I was, I was coming in when I was, I listened to um, Jay Sekulow coming in and, and I put him on the prayer list this young man, I'm going to say his name. This, you know, we just had the National Day of Prayer about, what, a couple of weeks ago. And I guess this general who's in the military, uh, he was asked to speak. And he really, he didn't even mention the name Jesus. He just basically talked about his faith and also about how Washington prayed, knelt, and prayed. Well, this young man who 
is, I guess he's part of this atheist movement called Freedom for Religion, but that's a misnomer, because it's not freedom for religion, it's freedom from religion. So his, his name is Mikey Weinstein, or Weinstein, however you want to pronounce it. So put him down, because he needs Jesus. He's way out there in left field. He's so out there in the left field, he wants this, this man, this general, court-martialed because of what he said. Now, I just told you what he said. He didn't get up there preaching. He wasn't up there proselyting. He merely talked about his experience and about Washington, and he didn't even use the name Jesus. You know, they get real upset when you use Jesus' name. And he wants him court-martialed because of, based on what he said. So this, and then he, in another statement he made some time ago, is that, because he's trying to get, that's why a lot of the chaplains are leaving the military, because they don't want them to say anything about God or Jesus. If they do, he's basically saying they should be court-martialed, they should be, I mean, he says some crazy stuff. I mean, really way out there. So lift him up that the, a laborer will go into his pathway. Someone who, that's why we're so, so, so adamant with you learning the word of God, knowing the word of God, so that people like that you can minister to effectively because you have information available to you. So his name is, is Michael, I think it's Michael or something, Michael or, or Mickey Weinstein. But he is, he's over, <laughs> just get this, uh, they have made him over in uh, the administration, he is over the religious uh, element of a uh, uh, department or something. So they made somebody that doesn't believe in religion, quote unquote, over this. Can, now, is, is that insane or is that insane? How insane can you get? That's why people, they, they really need Jesus. When I say, I'm, this is not a cliche, I'm telling you, they have gone absolutely positively crazy. They really need Jesus. He is their only way, hope. There is no hope outside of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're not trying to be, you know, uh, put anybody down. I'm just telling you what it is, because if they knew him, then they wouldn't be going through this. So we started last week talking about the deity of Christ and, and looking at him in his seven I am statements. And so last week we talked about, and that's kind of a review at the top, we talked about how he says, I am the bread of life. And I told you last week that when you go to Exodus, we're not going to turn there. I'm just reviewing this segment only. In Exodus 16, 1 through 35, you do have that uh, handout. We said that the manna, that uh, it was a type of Christ as the bread of life. It came from heaven because he came down from heaven to die, to die for the life of the world. And so when you, we talked about shadows and type uh, some time ago. And I gave you what a shadow or type is. A type is a historical fact that illustrates a spiritual truth. We also said a type is a divinely purposed illustration of some truth. It may be, it can be a person, it can be an event, it can be a thing, it can be an institution, or it can be ceremonial. And when we say shadows and type, so the Holy Spirit and shadow or type, he, the, it's those characteristics of the Holy Spirit that he wants us to see. And so we said that the manna was a type of Christ. And then I talked about last time also the showbread. The showbread was also a type of Christ. It's the bread of God, nourisher of the Christian life as a believer. And when you look at the Old Testament, everything that's in the Old Testament, Jesus is, is in there. He's revealed. I'm going to show you, and I, I thought I had it in color, and I'm so sorry I don't have it in color. But I want to show you the showbread, a picture of the showbread. And that represented Jesus Christ. 
a type of Christ that Jesus sustains. He sustains us. He's a giver of life, but he also, what? He sustains us. Amen? And so when you look at the Old Testament, when you read Exodus and all those, those scriptures and talk about the candle stick and all of that, all of that is a prefigure of Jesus Christ. So that's why Jesus Christ can, can be seen in, in the whole Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Well, of course, you know, I can't find the bread right now. So, but anyway, it was 12 loaves. What did the 12 loaves represent? The what? 12 the 12 tribes of what? The 12 tribes of Israel. I thought I had it out, but anyway. But I was going to show you. So, when, so that bread just wasn't there just for the sake of being there. It represented something. It was a type of Jesus Christ. It represents how God, what? He would sustain us. And that's, what Jesus, that's why Jesus, and what we talked about last week, we said Jesus is the what? The bread of life. And so what does bread does? It gives us, it sustains us, gives us life. Okay, I can't find it up and so I'll move on. All right, and so then, so what we saw two things. Manna is the life-giving Christ. And the showbread, well, those 12 loaves that the, the priest had to change every day, the showbread showed the life-sustaining Christ. Okay, are you with me? Now, tonight we're going to talk about the second I am statement, and that is, I am the light of the world. So I want you to turn your Bibles to uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Let's go there. In John chapter 8. And we're going to read verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12. Are you there? It says, in case you hear some pages turning. It says, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And if you look at your definition, I talked about the candlestick. If you go in the Old Testament, the candlestick, and that's in Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. I'm not going to read that whole thing, but I do want you to take a look at that. So keep your finger here in John, because we're going to come back to John. So you're going to be flip-flopping back and forth. And so in Exodus chapter 25, and so when you see, when you read this, in the Old Testament, it's just not... It's just not a, a candlestick. It has a significance. So Exodus chapter 25. Are you there? Okay, I'm getting there. And starting at verse 31, I think I'm going to start there. Yeah, it says, and, thou, and this is the description. God is very specific. Uh, very clear in his directions. And so this is what he's telling Moses. He says, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches, his bows, his knops, and his flowers, and sh shall be of the same. Verse 32. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. And then it goes on to talk about the three bowls. And so if you look on your handout, I told you that the candlestick, it was a representation of Christ who provides life. And I wanted to give you, because when we go to Isaiah chapter 11, I want to let you know what each one of these represent. And so this, this candlestick, if you look at the definition of it over here on, on, the, on the definition side of lesson part A, it says it's called the menorah. It's a Hebrew word, and it's called the menorah. 
And so it, it, it brings, it glistens, it brings light. And then I give you various definitions of light because you didn't, I didn't want you to take time to write all this down, so I hand it out to you. The word light is the illumination derived from a source. So Christ is our source, and he said he's the light of the world, that so our source of light comes from him. And so on the light, it means spiritual awareness. It means illumination. It means something that enlightens or provides information. When we got born again, we were enlightened. We received information. When people read this Bible all the time, but when they read it, they are not reading with an enlightening attitude. Why? Because they're not born again. There, I mean, a lot of people who were atheists began to read the Bible just to disprove that the Bible was incorrect and end up getting born again. Uh, Lee Strobel is one. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he's a journalist. And so he, uh, so, and, and I think uh, the, the real popular one, I can't think of his name, but he's going to be with the Lord, but he was another one, and they quote him a lot. Um, he's another one that was an atheist, and to prove Christianity false, what he did, he began to research and study. And each time they would research and study, they ended up getting born again. So you can read, and there's a gentleman that I'm thinking about, I won't call his name, but I mean, you know, he reads, he's read the Bible over and over. Read the Bible probably more than the average Christian. But he's reading it spiritually dead. There, there is no enlightenment. No light is shining on his spirit because he's spiritually dead. That's why when they read the Bible, they don't understand certain things. For example, when my, my sister and my brother got married over, uh, back in 93, and he, of course, went along with her because she was really strong in the word, but one of my relatives said, well, this is the first time I've been to a wedding and there is no alcohol. See, that's strange to the world. See, for us who've been in the word in a length of time, that was normal. Alcohol, drinking alcohol is abnormal for us. But he said, wow, this is the first time that I've been to a wedding and you don't have alcohol. Well, see, that's a person that's spiritually dead. They, ha they have not been in. He's, Jesus is the light of the world, and he brings light. He brings illumination to our hearts and to our minds. I mean, when we truly get born again, I mean, just revelation knowledge just began to unfold. And so he says, I am the light of the world. And he says, if... The world is walking in darkness. Will you agree that the world is in definitely in darkness today? But guess what? If Jesus is the light of the world, you and I are born again. Jesus says he lives where? In us. So if he lives in us and he's the light of the world, guess who else is the light? That's why, as crazy as this world is, and it's getting even crazier, when we're ratcheted up out of here, oh my gosh. That's why I, it's, it's our responsibility to get as many people saved as we can. Because when they go through the tribulation, it's not going to be no joke. You think what we're seeing our brothers and sisters going through now, that's just an introduction our brothers and sisters across the land and other places. That's just an introduction for the end times, for the great tribulation. Because when we're out of here, the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. And when he snatches us out of here, my Lord, people, they'll really, they really will be devouring one another. But they don't have to. That's why we, we've been called to what? To preach the good news. Amen? 
And so that's what we better be on our job because time is winding down. So, uh, so this word light is sub- a spiritual awareness. It means illumination. The second definition under light, it means something that enlightens or provides information. And as, as the, you know, as whoever is teaching, whether it's Pastor, me, or Minister Jefferson, or whoever is up here teaching, the, the word of God, there's the anointing on the word. And it brings forth what light. It brings for what revelation knowledge. It illuminates your heart. It illuminates your mind. So you have an understanding of the scripture. This word lamp is a device that generates heat, light, or therapeutic radiation. It's a vessel holding oil or alcohol burned through a wick for illumination. It can be a mental or emotional enlightenment. Now, this word illumination, it means spiritual or intellectual enlightenment. Also, it means clarification or elucidation. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. We're going to take a look at that. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And we're going to look at the branches on this menorah. So what's that candlestick called? A menorah. So when you go to Israel, you have some knowledge of the Hebrew, at least one Hebrew word. (laughs) And shalom, you know those two. (laughs) Okay. So I'm going to read into verse 2. I'm going to focus on verse 2. So I'll start at verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, this is Isaiah. And he's talking about Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ came out of what tribe? Okay, I got some sober students in here, and I didn't hear some answers. Don't y'all gonna get y'all report? Excuse me? <laughs> he graduated, two year program. You, you should have been the first one to say something. Nah, just messing with it. Okay, so uh, Jesus is from the tribe of what? Judah. And what does Judah mean? Praise team. (laughs) Judah means what? Praise. And so he said, a stem of Jesse. And so Jesse was whose father? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Doss. (laughs) David, of uh, outstanding, one of the outstanding kings of Israel, the second king of Israel. God, in all the stuff that David did, committed adultery, murdered somebody, but guess what he said? He said, David is a man after my own heart. Why? Because he was quick to repent. Not say I'm sorry. See, sorry means you sorry you got caught. And you don't really mean it. You just mean it at that moment. Repentance means what? Making a 180 degree turn. It's a mindset. Repent me it has to do with a mindset. That's why we got to renew this thing up here. All of us, including yours truly. If I would renew this every day, and even when I renew it every day, sometimes I get in the flesh real big. That's why it's so important to renew this mind. You cannot afford not to hear the word of God on a daily basis. None of us can. Because we're going to be in that flesh. Even when you walk out of here, you can get in the flesh. Hear a good sermon. And then walk out of there and get in the flesh with somebody. That's how quickly it can happen. But see, but what you do, you stay focused, right? We just keep. And see what? There is no condemnation to those who what? Love the Lord in Christ Jesus. Who brings condemnation when you mess up? The enemy. So you know what? You know his tactics. You know what he does. You don't have nothing new. No strategies are new for him. So when he brings that condemnation, tell him what the blood of Jesus did. Whoa, glory. What did it do? It it eradicated. But that doesn't mean we go and live like a dog. That means that we go continue to what? To 
just, he says, if you obey me, if you love me, what are you going to do? You're going to keep my words. You're going to keep my saying. And so the way that we uh, show the Father that we love him is by keeping his word. Keeping his word. God cares about your, your emotions, but that's not what he deals with. He's after you. God wants your faith, confidence, trust in him. If he said that I, I will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on me, on him, then that's what he means. So when you and I don't, are not experiencing that peace, that lets us know that what happened to our mind. Straight away. Straight away from the word of God. Because child of God, you and I are supposed to be walking in perfect peace. And if you're not walking in peace, if you're not being that peacemaker, but a peace breaker, you haven't removed the mind. You got to go back. And whatever that area that you're weak in, or that's giving you a child, that's the word, that's where you're going to go to the word and study it and say it, decree it, declare it, say it over and over again. It's the same principle when, when, when Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I, I uh, forgive my brethren? Seventy times seven, right? In other words, the principle is, I have it necessary. If it's 749 times or if it's a thousand times, the principle is you have to forgive. You must forgive and I must forgive. Amen? Amen. All right. So, talking about Jesus' light. So we looked at where the lamp is. Illumination, we talked about that. All right, let's go. To, oh, you in Isaiah? Did I ever tell you? Okay, I was reading that. So let's go to verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of what? The spirit of wisdom. And so they said that the, one of our, we got this from one of our, somebody. So the spirit of wisdom, what else? Read on. The spirit of what? Okay, so these, these here represent wisdom. Each one, this represents understanding. What else? You keep reading. The spirit of what? Counsel, counsel meaning getting good and sound advice. All right, so the spirit of counsel. And what else? Might, Might which is the same as power. What else? Spirit of, spirit of knowledge. And what else? The spirit of the, the, the spirit of what? Reverence, which means what? It's a what? A reverential fear, not a scared fear. So, when you see this candlestick of the menorah, it's representative of who Christ is and what he, what he is. That's who he is. The spirit of wisdom. The spirit of understanding. The spirit of knowledge. The spirit, that's, and that's what's lacking sometimes even in the body of Christ. There's not enough reverence for Almighty God. get to the point to where, because we have such a relationship with him, but sometimes you get into, we, you treat him almost like commonplace. He's a holy God. I mean, we were singing, what's Michelle? Michelle, we were singing that song, Yeshua is holy. Was it Yeshua? Yahweh. Yahweh is holy. He's a holy God. And he's to be treated in a holy way. Respectful. Honored. Highly esteemed. Because he's holy. And he said in 1 Peter 5, 15, 16, he says, be ye holy. Telling us it's be verb. Means we're, it's our responsibility to be holy. Why? He said, because I am holy. Why? Because we've been partakers of his divine nature. So we have his divine nature residing on the inside of us. Therefore, you and I can be what? Holy. So this represents Christ. This, this candlestick, the menorah, it represents Christ in, in giving us all that information that I share with you in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Let's go to Hebrews chapter. I'm going to skip. 
Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. And then I'm, you have uh, Revelation 1, 4. You can read that on your own time. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews. Are you there? Uh, Michelle, read that out there. I didn't bring my amplifier. Read that out the amplifier for me, please. You have loved righteousness. You have delighted in integrity, virtue, and uprightness in purpose, thought, and action. And you have hated lawlessness, injustice, and iniquity. Therefore, God, even your God, Godhead, has anointed you the oil of exultant joy and gladness above and beyond your companions. And oil is a type of uh, representing of the Holy Spirit. He says what? He gives us the what? The oil of what? Of gladness. You anointed thee with the what? With the oil of gladness. And so why are we walking around with sour faces when we've been anointed, that word anoint means to smear on or rub on, put on. So we've been anointed with the oil of gladness. So there, we shouldn't be walking around sad. I don't care what the situation is, what the circumstances present. You had to go to the scripture and understand that the oil of gladness, that's the Holy Spirit. That he has a, no, he do, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. So guess what? Joy and gladness are already on the inside of you. What you have to do is cause it to manifest outwardly. How? By acting on the word of God. God has done everything he's going to do. He's given us his word. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He sent Jesus. And he says, now, you got it. Now you do it. The oil of gladness. Not sadness, but gladness. So I don't want to see no sad faces around here, including mine. So put me in check. Miss Miriam, why do you have that sad looking face on? Okay, because I'm teachable. See, if you're going to grow in the things of God, you have to be teachable. Can't be a know-it-all. Because if you know everything, you just just need to translate and go on to be with Jesus. No, we're going to continue to grow, what, as long as we're here. And I desire to grow. How about you? I want to grow from what? From glory to glory to glory until he comes and gets us. I go to be with him. Amen. All right. Okay, so now we're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 16. Let's take a look at that. Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. We're still looking at how he's, he says, I am the light of the world. Genesis chapter 1, verse 16 says, are we there? And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also. So this greater light here again is a type of Christ because he is the great light. And then I love the scripture. Let's go to Malachi. That is the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2. Malachi. Chapter 4. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, are we all there yet? Okay, very good. He says, but unto you that fear my name. How many of you fear the name of the Lord? All right, I know I do. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness. That's talking about Jesus. The son of righteousness arise with what? Healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Who glory. (laughs) 
Hallelujah to Jesus. And then let's go to John chapter 1, verse 4. The Gospel of John. And for those of you who are here for the, uh, John, <laughs> John always says, the disciple that, that Jesus loved. So he knew that he was loved by Jesus. Why? Because he made that declaration all the time. So I just emulate a John with John. I'm the beloved. That's why when, uh, when I send out emails and I have my little saying at the bottom, one of the words I put that you are what? You are beloved. You are deeply beloved. You need to know that. I mean, there are Christians that don't know that they are loved by God. They see God as some big ogre, uh, uh, big judge. He's going to judge, but that's toward the end. He sent for Christ. Christ came to seek to save that which is lost. Christ didn't come to judge the first time. He came to redeem by back man out of the very pit of hell itself the first time. But when he comes back, he's coming back as what? Judge. Coming back as judge. Amen? We don't have to be concerned about that. The judgment. So, in verse 4 it says, In him, that's in Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. And so in him was light, and that light was passed on to those who will accept him as Lord and Savior. Let's look also at verse 5. Oh, that's what I read. No, I didn't. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Didn't receive it. Didn't receive that light. When they come here, they didn't attempt to understand it. Because when you read the Gospels, you see what, especially in the Gospel of John, you see what this, some of the things that they uh, tried to do to him. Throw him off on a clip, do all kinds of things. And then, in f let's look at Psalm 119, the 119 division of Psalm. 119. And we're going to look at verse 105, I believe. Okay, are we there? All right. He says, Thy word is a what? A lamp unto my feet. I gave you a definition for lamp already. Uh, unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. What was, what's the purpose when folks use a flashlight? Why are you using that flashlight? So what? And so, and yeah, so you can see because you want to what? Right. So you, what? You, you're trying to follow a pattern of your way, a direction, right? So that's what, that's why Christ came. That's why he said he's the light of the world. So that light gives us direction. That's why we use the lamps. If you, don't, if you walk in a dark room, we walk in this room, turn the light off for a minute. I know you, I know you, 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 just for a quick second. Oh, it won't work? It won't, would that go, uh-uh, no. Will it go off? It won't, just, just flick it off real quick and then right back off. Okay, that didn't work. I want to, okay. Wow, that's what I'm talking about. So I need some light. All right, quickly turn it back on so I can find my way. <laughs> Amen. I'm messing up these technology folks. I love y'all. <laughs> they work with me. They know I am not technology savvy, and I just be having them doing all kinds of stuff. Praise the Lord. All right. So, <laughs> glory. So his word. So the word of God is a lamp unto our feet, and it's a light unto our path. It gives us direction. Gives us instruction. It illuminates. We get an intellectual uh, enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment. All those definitions I read you about the light, that's what you get when you get born again. So you have all of that on the inside of you. 
So I want to encourage you to utilize what you have. As Jesse Jackson used to say years ago, it's old. You are somebody. <laughs> but you're somebody because of Jesus. Amen. That's why you're somebody. In and of yourself, you're nobody. Because he says, Jesus said in, the gospel, in John 15, 7, he says, Without me, you can't do nothing. Nothing you can do without him. Aside from him, you cannot do it. Even when you don't even acknowledge that he's giving you that, that ability. See, everybody born into this world is made in the image of God. They just, uh, because they have not accepted a plan of salvation, they're walking around spiritually dead. They got a lot of book sense, a lot of technological sense, but spiritually ignorant. They got about 50,000 degrees. Some folks who go to degree got five and six degrees. Nothing wrong with the degree I have too. But, but, but if, I don't, if you don't have a BA in Christ Jesus or MS or PhD in him, all your little degrees in the secular institution don't mean squat dooley. You know I'm from the South. Squat dooley. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the <our> Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So, so we're going to start now with chapter 9 uh, of John. We're going to go through that as far as we can tonight. And we're still talking about him being the light, and we're going to see it from another aspect here. So let's go to John chapter 9. And just to kind of give you like a introduction. This entire chapter illustrates the light of the world in action, talking about Jesus, Jesus being that light. So we see the light, Jesus, in this world. He's in action as he reaches into this dark pit of man's life. He opens his eyes and sets him free. So the first thing we're going to look at and starting at verse 1 and 2, we're going to read verses 1 and 2, and then I'll kind of uh, comment on it as we read it. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. So now this man had never seen. He had never had any sight. The Bible said he was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. So they here ask him a theological question because they had this common belief, uh, Israel had this common belief, or the Jews had this common belief that physical sickness was directly resulted to sin. And they got that in Exodus. So if you go to Exodus chapter 20, let's look at Exodus, and I think I wrote some of those scriptures on your outline that I gave you. So if you look at Exodus chapter 20, you'll see why they would make that statement. Because remember, they were under the law of Moses. So we're going to look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Exodus chapter 20, yeah. verse... Okay, it's a mistake. Well, let me see. Hold on. I don't think I have that one. Do I have that one? Let me see it for a minute. It's 20, verse 5. Would you correct my mistake? See, human error. See, we're subject to mistakes. See, we're not perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. So make that 5 a big, fat 0. Okay? All right. So 20, verse 5. This is when Jesus, uh, God was given the, the Ten Commandments. Uh, the first ten. So it says that, and the reason, uh, you read the, uh, the, the context, Israel, he's, he's telling him, don't you have no other gods before me? Nothing, uh, verse 4, no any, no any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or at the earth in, but beneath. He says, thou shalt not bow down thou self to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers 
upon the children unto, unto the third and fourth generation of them that what? Of them that hate thee. So here, this word uh, visiting means to oversee, it means to charge, care for, it means to deposit, it means to punish, av avenge, it means judgment. This word iniquity. And there's a scripture that says he has forgiven in Psalm 103.3. Oh, I'm so glad that he says, I forgive all your iniquities, not some of them. And this word iniquity is perversity. It means moral evil. It means fault. It means mischief. It's sin. It's guilt. It means to be bent, bowed down, and twisted. It's a perversion of intent, a bending of rectitude into willful willful disobedience. It's a perversion of truth. Now this one really caught my eye. A perversion of truth. I mean this is going on so now in our culture they're calling what? Right wrong and wrong right. A perversion of the truth. It's very prevalent and I don't even have to tell you what I'm talking about. A pervert is a, a perversion of the truth is a twisting into error. And if you don't know this word, uh, many Christians are falling prey to what they're telling them about that situation. Why? Because they don't, they don't study the scripture. And because they're not rooted and grounded in the word, they're going to be easily persuaded. You're supposed to be persuading them. But Christian churches are being swayed in that direction. Churches, the ecclesia, that's what the church is. We're the church, not this building. The called out ones are saying the same thing that the world is saying. Something's wrong with that picture. We're the ecclesia. That's who the church is. We're the called out ones. We are an assemble of people. And we assemble to come here to assemble to worship our Heavenly Father, to give him praise and honor, and also to study the word of God. So that we, when someone asks you and me a question, we will have an answer. Because 30 some years ago, as a believer, me, I can talk about me. As a believer, I, don't, I didn't know nothing. I just knew I accepted Jesus, and, I, and, I, and the whole purpose was to accept Jesus when I was 10 years old. The whole purpose was to accept him so I could miss hell. But didn't know how I was supposed to live in between getting saved and going to heaven. So in the meantime, what you're living like, I don't know, what, looking like somebody who is not saved. And that's still the reality now. Now, we kind of had an excuse because where we grew up, there was no word going forth. No kind of teaching. Just a hooping and a hollering and a pulling on the ear and a dancing around. But no word going forth. And of course, people in the pulpit was doing the same thing you were doing. But thank God, he raised up a group of people that would be an example to the body of Christ. In 1 Timothy 4, 12, he says, be example. And not just pastors, but us too. We're to be examples before the believers, he said. He says, in word, what we say, in conversation, our total lifestyle, in faith. They should see our faith in operation and in purity. That's 1 Timothy 4, 12. He said, we're to be in examples. So that's what I pray. During my prayer time, I pray for the leaders to be examples before the believers in word. And I pray for us as believers that we walk worthy of him unto all pleasing. That we'll be fruitful in every good work, not in darkness, not cohabiting with darkness, being fruitful in every good work, increasing, ever increasing faith, increasing in the knowledge of him, according to his glorious power, 
and long suffering with joyfulness. I just prayed a scripture found in Colossians. We pray the word. And that's my prayer for believers all over the world, specifically at Spirit Food, because this is where God has placed me, but then other believers all over the world. What? We're, we're one, amen? Just because you belong to another church doesn't mean that you're not my sister. And we got to get away from this segment, this division. Jesus can't come back to this. He says, I'm coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle until we all come into the unity of faith. Not unified yet. But you and I make a decision to be unified. It starts with you. It starts with me. Don't look at her. Don't look at him. Look at me. When I say me, look at you. I'm looking at me where I can make the proper changes. It's the same thing in relationships, whether it's a marital relationship or a relationship with one another as we work in ministry. Where can I make the change? We be, you be, I be the spiritual one to make the change in the relationship, whatever the relationship is. Don't wait for them to change. You bring about the change. And when we change, God is so good that he'll get a hold of that person and bring about changes also in their lives. But we can't change nobody. We can't even change ourselves. We have to have the Holy Spirit to help. Amen? All right. So... I don't have a clue where I was. Praise the Lord. So where did I leave off, you guys? Oh, okay. So did I read it? Oh, yeah. So the reason that uh, they said what they said over there in John, uh, this man sin, because this is, uh, and all those, I won't turn to the rest of them, but all those scriptures that I put down there basically say the same thing about visiting the iniquities of the Father. So when we go back to John, go back to John, please. So when we go back to the Gospel of John, chapter 9, so we see why they made the statement in verse 2. When they asked, the disciples asked Jesus the question, uh, who sinned? Did this man or his parents? Because that he was born blind. Okay, then we're going to read Jesus' response in verses, uh, let's see, 3, 3. Okay, we're going to read 3. It says, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but, and meant some translators says, so that. So, in other words, and I'm, let me make a correction here. People say, well, you know, God put this on, on him for a reason. Well, God doesn't put anything on anybody. Let, let's, let's just, let me say this right now so we can get this clear. Because, I mean, when sickness and disease come, even though we're in this earth realm, we're not. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. However, for, we can be attacked because sin is still what? In this world. It's still here. And whether we give place or where it just happened for whatever reason, but you don't have to stay that way when you come under attack. When I came under attack, I, I, I didn't stay that way. I ch chose to what? to declare the word that by Jesus Christ I'm healed. But because I'm in this world, I can get attacked. We haven't been removed from this world. We're not in the millennium kingdom yet. So Adam, Romans 5, 12 said, sin entered to the world, how? Through Adam. So that's why there's sickness and disease. Now Jesus came and what and redeemed us from that, from the curse of the law. 
And we, instead of saying, well, why me? And I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'll say it now anyway. Instead of saying, well, why did this happen to me? No, you say, what do I need to do to change it? Stop saying the why means. Why me? Okay. Okay, Father. What do I need to do to change this circumstance? And was it a prayer that I shared? I can't remember if I shared this when I was attacked years ago in my stomach. And I hadn't gotten a leeway. I'm confessing to the scriptures and I'm confessing. And so I didn't ask the question, why I'm going, okay, what am I doing? What am I doing? I put it on me. What am I doing that I should be doing that I'm not doing? And he gave me the answer. He said, forgive yourself. Do you know that we're the, our worst enemy when it comes to forgiving? We sometimes are very easy to give others, but not forgiving ourselves. For some people. You have to forgive yourself. He said, just so quietly, forgive yourself. Because when you are operating, when you don't forgive yourself, you're under condemnation. Hello? And you've been redeemed from condemnation. So if you, if you are dealing with that, you're released in the name of Jesus. And the devil is a liar. Forgive yourself because Christ has already done it. Because when you don't forgive yourself, what you're basically saying is Christ's blood was ineffectual. And I know you don't want to say that. You're saying his blood, it didn't eradicate what it's supposed to do. Because whatever you did was so bad, so wrong, that his blood couldn't redeem you. That's a life from the pit of hell. There's nothing you can do. I mean, look at Saul of Tarsus. And look how God used him. David, as I mentioned earlier. So, forgive your forgiveness, forgive others, don't hang on to it. Because when you operate in unforgiveness, you're saying that person has power over your life. And I, Jesus said, He's given you power to tread on scorpions and all the ability of the enemies, and nothing shall by enemies hurt you. So, verse 4, he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am what? The light of the world. That's what we're talking about, the, his, his second I am statement. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And I told you that word anointment, mean, what he did, he took us, he spat on it. And you know, you really, when you do something like that, <laughs> you better know that what God told you to do it. <laughs> you ain't never been hit. <laughs> Woo! He spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, which is spit. And he anointed, that means he rubbed, smeared. That's what the word anointed means, rubbed and smeared the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed came seen. So the blindness gave an opportunity for God's power to be manifested. And he's... He says that I must work the works. He always said uh, God always worked with him. Jesus wasn't interested in why, but he was interested in what could be done for this man. Not why he was, he was, uh, he was blind, as the question they asked. Uh, it's like when I was uh, in education and I was a, a resource specialist for 31 years. And I had students come in that were way behind. This is middle school. But they were operating at second, third, and fourth grade math and reading. 
So I, I didn't have time to go and, and ask questions, well, why wasn't this done? Why didn't the elementary school teacher do this? And why didn't they do that? And why did they? That, I didn't have time for that. What I had time for is find out what they needed. What skills did I need to work on to bring them up to grade level? That was my objective. Not to find out why, because why is not going to help. But what will? What do I need to do to get the job done? And that's what we want to do. Amen? Amen. Is it, what does that mean? Zero? <laughs> Let's see. Oh my gosh, praise the Lord. All right, so let me finish this uh, verse 7 explaining that because I did want to bring out this. It says in verse 7, and I'll stop here, it says, And he said unto the man him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. He went his way therefore and washed. Now there's a difference between this man that was born blind and Naaman. How do you remember the story of Naaman in the Old Testament? Remember that story where the, uh, the king didn't come out to greet him like he thought he should? And, and he, uh, he says, what? Well, he told him to go wash in the, what, what, seven times in whatever the river it was, Jordan? Whatever it was. And he gets an attitude. He almost lost it. He almost lost his healing. Because, I mean, why did he come out? And aren't the rivers and so-and-so better than the way he's telling me to go? Just obey. Don't try to figure God out and how to do stuff. That's what's wrong with people. You're going to tell God how to bring it to pass. He can bring it to pass any way he chooses, as long as you get the results. Amen? Amen. Don't be concerned about how he does it, but just as long as what? It's done. Amen? And I have to quit. We're out of time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah to Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Glory to God. Salvation is the free gift that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy, but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father, and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you, be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving, and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast online at www myspiritfood.com Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30am and be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.